Elizabeth, go sit next to your mother right now. All right, now in Genesis chapter number 17, where we're at tonight, I'm not going to go through the whole thing verse by verse like I normally do. This entire chapter deals mainly with one big subject, and it's the subject of circumcision. This is where we see, um, just to do a broad overview of the chapter, we are going to read some of the verses and dig into it. But we see here God makes a covenant with Abraham. And a covenant is literally just a promise. It's like a deal. Right? When you enter into a covenant with somebody, it's, it's, you're kind of making an oath or a promise. And usually there's two sides to the agreement. Right? And you both need to keep your end of the bargain in order to, for that covenant to be good and to be lasting. We're going to get into that a little bit. But we see here that the covenant that God makes with Abraham, he seals it with circumcision. He says in verse number 11, look down, it says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So the circumcision itself, it's just a symbol. It's symbolic. It's a token. That's exactly what he's saying. And you're doing this because it's representative of the covenant that I've made with you. So I need you to do this. And, and it's, it's a token just, I mean, similarly, the way that God gave the rainbow, right? It's a token. It's something in the sky as because he made a covenant with Noah. And he said, I'll never again destroy the earth with a flood. And the token of that covenant was the rainbow up in the sky. And he says, I'll see the rainbow and I'll remember. And, and you remember that, that I'll never destroy the world again with a flood. So circumcision, is it's always just been a token. People in the Bible thought that circumcision was necessary for your salvation. And that was in the book of Acts that you could see the people, um, the apostles were fighting that heresy. And that was a strong heresy saying, nope, you must be circumcised in order to be saved. But that was never the case. Romans chapter 4 explains that very clearly. And we see even here, just reading it in context, reading it normally, reading it for what it says, he's saying, look, this is a token. This is a sign. This is a symbol to show the covenant that we've made, the covenant that I've made with you today. But um, before we get too heavy into that, I'm just going to go real quick through, because um, of course we see Abraham, Abram's name is changed to Abraham in this chapter. So let's start reading verse number one. The Bible says that when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So he's talking to Abraham and saying, Look, I need you to walk in my ways and I'm going to make a covenant. It's going to be between me and you, Abraham. Right? That's exactly what he says. It's going to be between me and you. And will multiply thee exceedingly. I'm going to give you a lot of kids. There's going to be a lot of children born in your line. Verse 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And that's important. He says, look, you're going to be a father of many nations. Abram is not just a father of one nation, the nation of Israel. I mean, that's, that's who everybody, you know, the, the children of Israel will claim and put so much stock in Abraham. But Abraham is a father of many nations. I mean, don't forget he had, he had um, Ishmael also had um, 12 princes that were born unto him that, that many nations were, were, came out of him as well. And Abraham is the father of both of them. Now, of course, he's not the son of promise, right? Isaac was the son of promise. But Abraham literally, if we're just going physically by the seed, by the flesh, by the, by the children of Abraham, Abraham was the father of many nations, okay? So physically speaking, if, you, if you're going to trust just in flesh and just say, well, I'm born of Abraham. It's, it's ridiculous. It's silly because there's tons of people that are born of Abraham because he's a father of many nations. And there's no, you should have no confidence in that flesh. And the Bible is very clear about that as well, especially in the New Testament, going over the, child, the, the, the son of promise versus the son of the flesh. And, and that's what Ishmael is, the son of the flesh. Isaac's the son of the promise. But let's keep reading here. He says in verse number 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. And the reason why is because for a father of many nations have I made thee. So God changes his name. Names in the Bible have meaning. 
all names, especially when God changes somebody's name, like Simon Peter's name was changed to Cephas, Cephas meaning a stone, right? God has um, a bow and urges, so James and John. Well, they're, no, they're the sons of thunder, right? There, there's names that are given to these people because they're descriptive, because there's something that's in the meaning of their name that, that goes along with the person. So Abraham inherently, just like Eve is the mother of all living, that's what her name means. That's why she was given that name. Abraham is given this name. God changes his name from Abram to Abraham because he's made him a father of many nations. So inherently in Abraham's character and in his name is the fact that he is the father of many nations, that God has blessed him. And one of the reasons why I believe God makes that so important is because Abraham was 99 years old when God's going to, you know, he's going to be 100 years old when this promise actually comes to pass. It's a big deal. This isn't something just to overlook. I mean, how often do you see a 90-year-old woman and a 100-year-old man having children together, right? And this isn't like the days of Adam and Eve where people were living to 900 years old. This is, this is much past that, past the flood, when people weren't living nearly that long. He was an old man. And he's even saying now, like he's laughing. He got in his face. He laughed in his heart. And he's like, shall a man that's 100 years old have a son? And she that's 90 years old, you know, um, give suck or whatever, you know, like, like, she's past the time of women. She's, she's already past that, that period in her life of, of childbearing. This is a, a miracle from God. This is just to prove that nothing is too hard for the Lord. God remains true to His promise. When God promises something, even when every chance in the world looks like it's impossible, God can do the impossible. You'd look at a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman and say, it's impossible for you to have children. Science today will tell you, it's impossible for you to have children. You can't do it. It's, it's, it's the, the odds are, you know, a million billion to, to zero. I mean, there's no chance. You have zero opportunity of getting pregnant. But God said, no, I made a promise. And I make good on my promises. And that's exactly what it is. So wrapped up in Abraham's name is the fact that he's a father of many nations because God is a God that keeps his promise. God is a God of covenants and keeps His promise. Very important to understand this too because what we're going to be dealing tonight with is this covenant, is this promise. And so many people these days are deceived into thinking that because of this promise that was made, they believe that the, the so-called nation of Israel today has rights to that land that's in the Middle East. And people today think that, oh, these people who are the physical descendants of Abraham deserve to have these boundaries laid out for them. And that's their land because God made an everlasting covenant. And this is what they're going to turn to when they go to try to prove that. So I want to spend pretty much the entire sermon focused on this one subject because it really is what the whole chapter is kind of about anyways. And it's a very important topic today to understand and to get our doctrine down right so we're not deceived by this and that we can just see the truth. Just read the Bible for what it says. There's not going to be a bunch of acrobats going on tonight to try to get you to understand what this passage is teaching. It's really straightforward, but there is a lot of Bible that we need to turn to and a lot of it's going to be coming from the New Testament because the New Testament shines all of the light that we need to see on the Old Testament. And besides, you know, this covenant, it was in place for a long time. And it did pertain to Abraham. And there was, there was his seed that it pertained to. And in context here, this wasn't just talking about Christ. Um, this is also talking about um, his descendants having that land. Now, there are promises made that was specifically to Abraham and to Christ. But here we're going to see a, a covenant that was made. You know, it, it, it included more than just him and Christ. It included his descendants. But everything is conditional. Everything is. And let's look at this. I mean, just like our salvation is conditional. If you believe with all thine heart. If you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If you believe those things, that's the condition that needs to be met for your salvation. Now, God is true and faithful in His promise and in His covenant. He says, if you have faith, if you put your faith in Christ, He is faithful and true. That's why it says um, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, you know, if we believe not, yet He abideth faithful. 
So people always like to ask that question when you go out soul winning. They'll say, well, what if you stop believing? You know, because we teach that the only requirement that's necessary for our salvation is putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll say, yeah, but what if you stop believing? And that's a good question because if all you have to do to be saved is believe, well then, yeah, what happens if you do stop believing? Well, the fact is, once you do put your faith in Christ, you're born again. You've already received eternal life. Eternal lasts forever. And we have the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And since I don't have it memorized, I have the reference memorized, I'll just read it for you. It says, it says I'll start reading verse 11. It says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. God can't deny himself. He, he, once you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. You can't deny himself. You're sealed. You're bought with a price. It's done. So even if you were to stop believing later on, God's already made the promise. Jesus Christ already said, um, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever um, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It's already happened. It's already over. Jesus is faithful and true. God is faithful and true unto his promises. He keeps his covenant, but that covenant is conditional. It's conditional on if you believe, if you put your faith in Christ. That's the condition. Well, he makes a condition here. Now, let's look at verse number 7. He says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So people will turn to this and say, see, look, it's an everlasting covenant that means it lasts forever. And that word everlasting, of course, it means it lasts forever. Right? But let's keep going on. It says in verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So people look at that and say that Israel inherited that land forever because he said it's an everlasting possession. And if we stop there, just say, okay, well, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, reading it for what it says, that makes sense. Now, the covenant that's established here is sealed with circumcision. As we just read earlier in verse 11, he says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And that's what he does to, to, to verify or to establish that covenant. And he says um, in verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Um, verse 13, He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money <coughs> must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And turn, if you would, real quick. Keep your finger here. We'll come right back here. Um, turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 24, because I want to see you some. I want to show you something that's important to see here in Isaiah 24, because we're talking about an everlasting covenant and an everlasting possession, right? We say, well, if it's everlasting, then it has to last forever. But don't forget, it's a covenant. Okay, God said. Um, made a lot of promises to people, but they were conditional. He said unto David, you know, if your sons will walk in my way, you will not fail from your seed, one that sits on the throne. And then he said the same thing to Solomon, right? But what happened? Solomon's heart turned away from the Lord. He didn't follow his ways perfectly like God made that promise unto David. He made the same promise unto Solomon. What happens? Solomon breaks that promise. Solomon breaks the deal. So what happens? The kingdom's rent from him from that point on. But because of David's sake, because God still had respect unto David, he allowed them to retain one kingdom, which he didn't even have to do that. I mean, he did for the prophecy's sake and you know, for everything else. But from the covenant he made like with Solomon, Solomon's heart turned away from the Lord. And it, they're in doing breaking that covenant. Now, it would have been everlasting had they kept their end of the deal. But they broke the deal. 
And we're going to see here, you're in Isaiah 24, look at verse number 5. Just another example, it says, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. So here we see a breaking, and it doesn't even matter what the covenant is. I just wanted to point that out that it's a breaking of an everlasting covenant. It's something that's broken. So it's not going to continue on once it's broken. It would, and that's the whole point, it would have been everlasting. That was the promise. But you have to maintain your end of the covenant in order for it to continue on forever. By nature of the covenant that God is giving here. Now, it's possible to break these covenants, even everlasting covenant. A covenant's agreement, it's just like a contract, it's conditional. The old covenant was conditional, and the inheritance was only promised if the people would obey God. That's why we started off this chapter saying, which you saying unto Abraham, you know, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee. And look at verse number 10. Now go back to Genesis 17. I just wanted to show you that from Isaiah 24 because ever, even everlasting covenants can be broken. Verse number 10, he explains what the covenant is. He says in verse 10, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. So he says, okay, you have to do this. I mean, he ex does explain that it's a token of the covenant, but he also says that, look, you have to do this. Every man-child shall be circumcised. He says on the eighth day, they need to be circumcised. He's like, I don't care if they're born in your house. I don't care if they're a hired servant. I don't care if they're a foreigner. I say, look, you all have to be circumcised. This is my law. This is the, the deal. This is the contract. This has to happen. He says... Um, in verse 13, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now, again, those words in your flesh is important. He's talking about a fleshly covenant, not a spiritual covenant, a fleshly covenant. Okay, and this, this is really important when we get into the New Testament passages just to understand this. That's why I make a mental note of these words. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14, And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Look, he hath broken my covenant. So right away, is it possible to break this covenant? Yes, it is. And if that covenant is broken, do they still deserve the everlasting possession? No. The covenant has been broken. So, and, and I maintain the covenant's been broken a long time ago. Okay? So the people that still want to cling to this and say, no, these children of, you know, the physical seed of Israel and of Abraham, they deserve that land because God gave it to them forever. They broke the covenant. It's over. And that's very clear in the New Testament. We're going to see, turn if you would to... Um, Where's the first place I'm going to be turning to the New Testament? Romans chapter 2. And I put these kind of in order of just so it's going to be easy, because we have a lot of scripture to turn to. Um, we're not going to be coming back to Genesis 17 anytime soon, so go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 2. And I tried to keep these in, in uh, chronological order of just where they, where they land in the Bible. Okay? So just to make it easier as we're flipping through all these references, I kind of grouped them together that way so we could just keep moving forward in the Bible for the most part. Um, <clears throat> Romans chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 25. Because we're looking here at the covenant that's sealed by circumcision. That's what se Genesis 17 is all about. And the New Testament speaks a great deal about circumcision in general. This is, this is the first time in Genesis 17, that's where circumcision starts. And then it's reiterated again in the Law of Moses. But it's the same exact rules. The eighth day, you know, we have a son. The eighth day, he needs to be circumcised. The, the rules laid out in the Mosaic Law, same exact rules applied with Abraham. God gave it to him then, and it continued on through the Mosaic Law, and all the way up until the time of Christ. 
So what we see here, a much better explanation of circumcision. Look at verse number 25. The Bible says, For circumcision verily profiteth. It's good. So they're saying, okay, hey, circumcision is good. It's good for you. It'll profit you if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So right away, right off the bat in the New Testament, the first place we look at, who here is could say, I keep the law perfect. I am no breaker of the law. Everything in God's law, I do. Not one. Who here thinks that people in the Old Testament can say, I've kept all of God's laws and I have never broken them. I'm not a breaker of God's laws. Do you think people were that much different back then? Do you think it's just so much easier to sin today than it was back then? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. People are the same in general. We have the same flesh. We have the same lusts, desires, everything. Nobody can keep the law. So circumcision right off the base says, look, it's good for you if you can keep the law. But if you can't, that, that, that physical act of having your foreskin removed, it's like it never happened if you're a breaker of the law. You can't rely on that for your, for your salvation, for the blessings from God. He says in verse number um, 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Look, if someone does everything right, even though they're uncircumcised, won't, that, won't they still just be accepted and they'll be considered as circumcised? Because look, they've done everything right. They've kept the law. Verse number 27, And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? He said, and, and then won't these people, the, these Gentiles or whatever, who, who are not circumcised, hey, if they're doing what's right, aren't they going to judge you? You who are circumcised, but you're a transgressor of the law, you're a breaker of God's law. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Talking about the flesh, the physical seed. You're not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. He's saying the circumcision of the flesh doesn't matter. It's not what it's all about. Verse 29, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. He's talking about it's the inward manifestation. It's circumcising your heart. You're removing the foreskin of your heart. And I don't want to get too graphic about this, but I mean, you're, you're, when you cut away the flesh, you're, you're, you're opening up that flesh and it's, it's symbolic. All of the stuff in the Old Testament, you know, all these, these old covenants and the... the, the um, the meats and the drinks and the divers washings, the carnal ordinances, these are all symbolic. These are all showing and teaching another truth, a greater truth. And the truth of circumcision, one of the, one of the, the teachings is that it should be applied to your heart, what's on the inside. And you need to remove that, that, that fleshly, you know, the, the blinders, so to speak, for one, you gotta remove the blinders when you put your faith in Christ. But that, that covering of the flesh is taken off. He's, talking, he's referring to that with your heart, um, circumcising the heart. Now there's a place, and I know I had said we're going to keep on going through um, Romans, but this is the perfect place to cover this because this, is, this actual um, reference about circumcising the heart is not just found in the New Testament. Stay in, keep your finger in Romans, but flip back to Deuteronomy. This understanding is given even in the Old Testament. This isn't something that was only discovered or shed light on in the New Testament. It's a teaching that was going on all the way back in Deuteronomy. Look at chapter 10 of Deuteronomy. Because this is one of the real important, uh, the important understandings of circumcision. It has to do with your heart, not your flesh. Now, just as they had to observe the Passover every year, right? And, and, and sacrifice the lamb. The importance of that wasn't in the shed blood of that lamb. It wasn't of them burning the lamb and eating that lamb. Like that wasn't the important part. The important part is what it represented. Just like with circumcision, the important part isn't actually carrying out the physical act as much as what it represents. Same thing. 
Now, they still had to do those. I mean, as part of God's law, just, just like everything else. I mean, they, these, were, these were the statutes, these were ordinances, all the things they had to follow. But what was the greater importance is what they represented. Deuteronomy 10.16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. So he's saying, he doesn't want you to resist God. Don't resist and be rebellious. Cut away that flesh. Cut away that part. Throw it off of you and just cleave unto God. Get rid of that, of, of whatever it is that's keeping you away from God, from, from being rebellious, from being stiff-necked, not wanting to listen to what God has to say. Cut that out and get rid of it. Deuteronomy 30. Flip over to chapter 30. We'll start reading in verse number 1 of Deuteronomy 30. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Look at verse number 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecute thee. In previous chapter, it goes on about the, the blessings and cursings from God. And he explains, he's giving a law, he's saying, look, if you keep these things, God will bless you, you'll stay in the land, God will defeat your enemies. But he says, if you don't do these things, you're going to be taken out of the land. Again, it, it further explains the covenant originally given unto Abraham. It's, it's further expounded in the Mosaic Law where he says, if you don't follow these things and do these things, this everlasting possession that I'm giving to you, you're going to be removed from it. And he says, but, you know, if you turn to me, if you turn to me with all of your heart, if you, you obey me, you call on me, you get right with me, he says, okay, I'll bring you back in. Now, the people who are living in that, in that nation of Israel today, have they turned unto God with all their heart? Are they, look, are they even, they're probably not even circumcised in their flesh, let alone in their heart. We know for sure they're not circumcised in their heart. Because, what does it say here? And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. If they love the Lord their God with all their heart and all their soul, they would accept Jesus Christ. They would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They would become Christians and they would just only believe God's word and what the Bible says and they would get right with him. But that's not what's going on today. They do not deserve, you know, th that covenant, they've broken. Jeremiah chapter 4, you don't have to turn there. Flip if you would back over to, um, we'll flip over to Acts chapter 7. That's right by Romans. Acts chapter 7. In Jeremiah chapter 4, 3, it's just another reference to, to um, circumcising the heart in the Old Testament. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. This is the importance of that circumcision is, is really a, a, the application to your heart and not being stiff-necked. We saw the reference of being stiff-necked in Deuteronomy 10. Look at Acts 7, verse 51. It's the same concept. Acts 7, 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, 
so do ye. He's saying the same exact thing. Look, you're stiff necked. You're not listening to what God has to say. You're being rebellious. You're being stubborn. You're not listening to him. You need to circumcise your heart. You need to replace that heart of, of flesh, that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. You need to get that stony heart. Look, rip away that, that, that fleshly covering and, and, and open up your heart to God is what he's saying. Take away the foreskins of your heart. He says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. This is when Stephen was, was you know, preaching at him and they, uh, they didn't like it. They didn't like hearing that they were in error. They didn't, I mean, because they, they're stiff-necked. He was telling them the truth. He was telling them the truth in love. He's trying, trying to get them to see, look, you need to stop being so rebellious, but they couldn't take it. And they ran it. They stopped their ears and they ran on him and they killed him. That's the way they dealt with Stephen. Flip, if you would, back over to Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3 now. We're going to see a few more references to circumcision and how the Bible um, talks about that. But these are... The importance here that we've seen the, the, uh, of what circumcision is all about has a lot more to do with your heart than it does with your flesh. And we saw that even if, you know, physically being circumcised is only going to profit you if you're able to keep the whole law. It's the only way it's good. And if you're not able to do it, then it's no good unto you. Romans chapter 3, verse number 28. The Bible reads, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, obeying the circumcision, having your son circumcised on the eighth day, that's keeping the law. But obviously right here it says, hey, we're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Does a person have to be circumcised to be saved? No. We're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You don't need to add any aspect or part of the law in order to be saved. If you did, and then you're just trusting in works. Why not just add all the works of the law? That's the only way you'd be able to do it. If you're going to be saved through the law, you better be saved by the entire law because you break in one point, you're guilty of all. Verse number 29, is he the God of the Jews only? And that's what the Jews will have you think. He's our God. It's a real racist mentality. You say, well, because we're physically of the seed of Abraham, you know, that's our God and, he, and we're his people. We're special. We're chosen people. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. He's saying whether you're, whether you're circumcised or not, it doesn't matter. You get saved the same way. It's always through faith. Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, look at verse number 9. Paul reads, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And what that's saying is that, look, we already um, covered the chapter where the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness in like Genesis 15. And that's before what we see happening here in chapter 17 where God is giving him circumcision. Like this happens much later. Abraham was accounted righteous through his faith when he wasn't, he wasn't even circumcised. God gave him to that after he was already declared righteous. It had nothing to do with his righteousness. of uh, you know, his, his circumcision had nothing to do with him becoming righteous. He was, already, he was already declared righteous because he had faith in God. Let's keep reading. He says, um, verse 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. See, the circumcision was a sign. It was a symbol of his righteousness. Similarly, today, we have a symbol of, we have the sign of baptism. 
right? Does a person get baptized before they're saved? No, it's after they're already justified. After they already put their faith in Jesus Christ, then comes the baptism. That's just the showing of your faith. The circumcision was also a way of separating them from the rest of the world to say we're God's people. Right? It was something they physically did that would separate them from the world. But here's the other thing, though, is that how in the world would you ever know if someone's circumcised or not? Because that's not something that you put out on display. That's something that's covered. That's something that only God can see. Just like God's the only one that can see your heart. And it's up to you to keep, the, to keep that law, so to speak, and do it, but it's also up to you to remove the foreskin of your heart. Other people may not be able to notice that, but God will be able to see it. Let's keep reading here in Romans 4. Look at verse number 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And again, we see, you know, there, there's so many ways that this is explaining that that circumcision, it doesn't come through obedience of the law. That's not what the promise was even for. It was through grace because righteousness has always been by grace through faith. You know, that I didn't really want to get into it when we we're out souling today, but that man said today um, that we were talking to was, was saying that how the people in the Old Testament had to do that Passover line every year. He was, he was saying basically to be saved. Like they needed to do that as if the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin, which obviously it can't. The book of Hebrews explains that very clearly. That is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It never has been. But um, the same way with circumcision. It's never been a requirement for a person to be saved. Now, as a part of the law, yes, is part of the law. But it was never a requirement for salvation. Was the Passover lamb keeping that part of the law? Yes. But is it a requirement for a person to spiritually be saved? No, it's always been through faith. Verse number 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of none effect. So he's saying, look, if you can be made righteous just by following the law, he says, faith is meaningless then. It's made void. Why do you need faith if you're able to be righteous through the law? You don't need the faith. Because you can do it all on your own. And he says, and the promise is made of none effect. You don't need to rely on the promise of God through faith because you're doing it all yourself. If they which are of the law be heirs. If that's what gives you your inheritance is obeying the law. He says in verse 15, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And I want to point out, too, when, when Paul's making this statement, who is he writing it to? This is the book of Romans. He's writing it to the Romans. Who are Romans? Gentiles. Now, the saved Romans, right? The church at Rome, he's writing it to believers, but physically speaking, many of them were, were Gentile of Gentile stock. But he says here, Abraham, who is the father of us all. He's not saying who is only the father of the Jews. Abraham's the father of us all because it's through faith. Because it's the, to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. First Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to see here very clearly, as New Testament believers, it is not scriptural, it is not a requirement, it is not anything you have to do. If, you, if, you have, if you're considering having children, if you have children, a lot of Christians think that they still need to get their, their sons circumcised. They still think that like, you know, by tradition or whatever reason that you need to do it. Or some people may think that, well, the Bible says that we ought to do that. And it's not 
true. Now, ultimately, it doesn't really matter. But I don't have any sons. If I do have any sons, they will not be circumcised. And I know it doesn't really matter, but the reason why I'm saying that they will not be circumcised is because there's a lot of people who are deceived into thinking that you do need to be. So just to make a point, obviously I wouldn't, and you know, people aren't going to see anyways, but I'm going to make the point and say, look, my sons will never be circumcised as far as, as long as they're in my house because that is not a requirement at all and I don't want anyone being deceived into thinking that we ought to be doing this thing. 1 Corinthians 7 explains this clearly. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, God's word says, is any man called being circumcised? Let him not be uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So if you've already been circumcised and you get saved, okay, well, great. There's nothing you can do about that. You're not going to go into uncircumcision, but it's already done. It doesn't matter. It's not like because you were circumcised, now you just have to keep the law. No, if you're called, you, got, you, know, you get saved, you put your faith in Christ, hey, it's done. If you get called, you're uncircumcised, and you put your faith in Christ, you believe, hey, don't get circumcised. He's, he's literally saying here, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. The way that you were, don't change it. So the way that my children are, my sons, that's the way they're going to be. And when they get called, hopefully when, when they get saved, when, you know, if and when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, we're not going to circumcise them. We're not going to make them debtors to the law. It's nothing. But so many Christian families today will still just continue to do that out of ignorance or whatever. And I mean, look, if you do it, I don't care, but don't do it because you think that the Bible says we have to. That's my whole point with it. And that's the reason why I'm not going to circumcise any of my children because I don't want anyone to think that it has anything to do with the Bible, especially looking at someone like me who's a pastor and say, oh, well, you know, pastor circumcised his children, so I better circumcise mine too. No. If you choose to do it for some other reason, fine, whatever. It's nothing. It's nothing. But that's, and that's all. And that's what the New Testament says very clearly. So let me ask you this then. If it's in the New Testament, if it's nothing, what does that say about that old covenant that God made with Abraham that supposedly is everlasting? If the apostles, if the apostle Paul is saying that circumcision means nothing, does he still think that we need to keep this as Jews? We need to be circumcised because God made the covenant with Abraham and we want this everlasting possession to be ours? No. That covenant has been broken. It's done. That old covenant has been done away when Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again from the dead. Done. Gone. There's a new covenant. Replace the old covenant. It's over. It could have been everlasting, but it's not. It was broken. It's nothing anymore. Circumcision means nothing. That token has lost its meaning in the New Testament because there's a better covenant. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. We'll see this even further. I mean, we're given ample evidence from the Bible about what the Bible clearly teaches about circumcision. Yet some people still want to say, nope, it still applies to the Jews. It still applies. To Paul was a Jew. And he says it's nothing. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, stand Fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, 
Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. He clears up those first, the verses 2 and 3 are pretty bold. He's saying, look, if you're circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. You say, well, wait a minute, I'm circumcised. What do you mean Christ profits me nothing? And he says, I testify again, every man that's circumcised, you're a debtor to do the whole law. But what he's speaking about, he's not saying like, you were circumcised as a baby and now you put your faith in Christ. He's speaking to the people. It says, whosoever of you are justified by the law. He's saying, if you think you need this to be saved, you're not saved. Just like anybody today that thinks they need to be obedient to God's law to be saved, they're not saved. They're fallen from grace. They haven't received the gift of God, the grace that God provides because they're trusting in the law. They've already broken the law. Why in the world would you want to trust in keeping the law for your salvation? The law brings wrath. The law is a curse. You're cursed. You've already broken the law. Circumcision is of the law. No. Circumcision is something you do to obey God's law. And he says, okay, if that's what you're trusting in, then now you're dead to do the entire law. Galatians 5, look at, jump down to verse number 6. The Bible says, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. How many times does he have to say this in the New Testament? It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Flip over to Galatians chapter 6. You're in chapter 5. Go to chapter 6. Galatians 6.12 says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So he's saying, yeah, the people that like to make a big deal about how good they are and how obedient they are, these Pharisees that love to stand in, in rooms and, you know, and they, they make their prayer before men to be heard of men, and, and they sound the trumpet when they give their money. These are the people that are going to try to get you. You need to be circumcised. Because it's all about the outward appearance and, and, and how holy they can make themselves look. They constrain you to be circumcised. Says they desire to make a fair show in the flesh. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. It's like they don't keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, guess what he's going to say again? Neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. It boggles the mind to think that people still to this day can cling to a doctrine that says circumcision is necessary for anything or for anyone. How many ways does it have to be said? In Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter. The only way it matters is if you decide you're going to try to keep the whole law. Good luck with that. Uh, turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2. I'll read for you from Philippians 3. Philippians 3, 3 reads, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So you're considered part of the circumcision. Even if, you're fleshly, if your flesh is uncircumcised, if you worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and you don't have any confidence in the flesh, you don't have any confidence in the law, you don't have any confidence in the fact that, oh, I'm circumcised. According to God, you are circumcised because you're circumcised in your heart. You're a Jew inwardly. And you inherit the promises that God made unto faithful Abraham because you are of faith. Nothing to do with the, the physical seed at all. It's such a major theme of the Bible that your physical descendancy means nothing. Nothing. What matters is your faith, what's on the inside, whether or not you put your trust in God. Colossians 2, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, bodily and we ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ this is something that happens spiritually it's a circumcision that doesn't happen physically with hands it happens without hands it's in your heart through Jesus Christ and in Colossians 3:11 says where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, 
but Christ is all and in all. That's the bottom line when it comes to circumcision. I mean, we turn to Romans 2, 3, 4, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians. In the Old Testament, we saw in Deuteronomy, in Jeremiah, he's talking about being circumcised in your heart. We saw in Acts with a reference to being uncircumcised, you know, to being stiff necked and uncircumcised in your heart and in your ears. All of this is explaining what Genesis 17 is all about this everlasting covenant. The first covenant was made was, was of the law was no good because men can't keep that covenant. The covenant has been broken. So God made a new covenant that's a lot easier to keep because it requires one thing and one thing only from us. The burden was lifted from being on us to being on God, to being on Christ. He did all of the work. See, an obe obedience to the law, that works on us. That's difficult. That's hard. We couldn't keep that covenant. God says, okay, I've got a new one, a much better covenant. Jesus did all the work. And His covenant stands and He says, if, it's conditional. If, but it's only conditional to do one thing. See, the old covenant was conditional and you had to maintain and keep the law. That was the, you said, if you continue in my word and continue in my deeds, if you continue in my law, then I will bless you. If you keep and do all of these things, I will bless you. But if you don't, you're going to have curses. That was his old covenant. The new covenant is if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. That's the new covenant. And that's something you only have to do one time. And God will remain faithful and true to his promise. He was faithful and true to Abraham. He made him a father of many nations. Even at 100 years old. Even with Sarah being nine, uh, 90 years old. And... Um, Flip back, if you would, real quick, Genesis 17. We'll just wrap it up because we also see Sarah's name is changed as well. And I just want to read that real briefly and then we'll, we'll close up. But, um, you know, God changed Abraham. We don't get the meaning of, of Sarah's name in the context right here. But he says in verse 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yeah, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. So this also gives further explanation to Abraham that it's not an Ishmael. Because the promises he made unto Abraham is not, was not given unto his son Ishmael. It's of his seed and of Sarah's. It's the child that's born in their old age, their child of promise that was given unto, um, unto Abraham was through Sarah. And, um, and he laughs about this. And um, so then Abraham follows through. And, that, and that's the good thing about Abraham. Abraham's real, he's faithful, he's a good leader. He's a friend of God and he listens to God. So... God says you have to be uh, circumcised. Abraham says, okay. He takes Ishmael. He takes everyone in his house. And he doesn't. Abraham was 99 years old when he got circumcised. And Ishmael was 13. 99 years old. But he was obedient to God's word. And, um, and that's what it closes up with in verse 27. All the men of his house, born in his house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For your word, God, I pray that you would please just help us never be deceived by the false doctrine that's out there. Um, it, there's so much scripture, scripture that shows us that circumcision is nothing, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just open up these truths, help, us, help them not to be confusing unto us, but that we would um, be able to shine the light of the New Testament on, on some of these passages in the Old Testament that we might not understand. Um, God, we thank you for being true to your word. 
and being faithful unto your promises that you make to us that we know that we have eternal life because that condition was not based on how good we are as the, uh, the covenant that you made with Abraham for that um, physical inheritance of that land, but that um, our eternal inheritance that we, that, that we receive, dear Lord, is through a covenant that's a much better covenant that has only one condition on it of us putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, dear Lord. We thank you so much for, for giving us that gift. And um, it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.